if we are going to be the men God has called us to be, if we're going to man up to our responsibility, that means we're looking out for idols that try to sneak in the home. Dr. Tony Evans talks about the role fathers can play in bringing revival to their families. Leadership is not just a title. Leadership means overseeing the atmosphere where I live. This is The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans, author, speaker, senior pastor of Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, and president of The Urban Alternative. Revival is contagious. And today, Dr. Evans explains how we can help it spread to the people who mean the most to us, our families. Let's join him as he takes us to Genesis chapter 24 for today's lesson. One of the most dysfunctional families in all of the Bible is the family of Jacob. Almost from the time of his birth, his family was in chaos. He connived with his mother to rip the blessing from his brother and to deceive his aging father. That would lead him to a life of deception and of uh, confusion. This man would enter into a civil rivalry with his brother Esau that would threaten his very life and he would grow up in a family of unforgiveness where Esau would seek to kill him. It was a family in chaos. He would see worked out in his own situation, in his own family, the continued flow of the family in which he grew up. His daughter was raped, Dinah. Her brothers were so incensed at the rape that they connived a plan that turned them into mass murderers. And so they slew a whole city full of men by getting them to agree to circumcision and in their moment of weakness, they would kill them. This was a family in crisis. You know the ongoing saga of them selling their own brother Joseph into slavery because of jealousy. This was dysfunctionality at the nth degree. Perhaps you know of families like this. Perhaps you grew up in a family like this. Where when you look back, it's chaos and confusion that has followed you. But our theme is revival. And so today I want to talk today about family revival where God returns to your home and brings order out of chaos and turns confusion around into something that is meaningful and productive. In chapter 35, right after the rape and mass slaughter that had become a part of Jacob's family, Jacob is now terrorized. Look at the end of verse 34 because all these men have been killed. Verse 30, then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me by making me uh, odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and Perizzites and my men being few in number, they will gather together against me and attack me and I will be destroyed and my family and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? They raped our sister, we're going to kill them. Jacob says, but now you've jeopardized the whole family. We're few, and now these folks are going to be in an uproar, and they are going to kill us. In other words, Jacob is in a crisis. He's in a bad situation now because now that this mass murder has occurred, he knows that these folks are going to rise up and do to his family what his family did to the men of that city. And it's a mess. In chapter 35, verse 1, we start off with two words, then God. Remember, whenever you see the word then, you've got to ask the question, when? In the midst of family disintegration at the highest level, then God said to Jacob, arise, go up to Bethel, 
live there, make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. Now you read that and it doesn't seem like much. But this whole story revolves around that statement. Arise and go to Bethel. Bethel is where Jacob met God the first time. Jacob knows he's supposed to go back to Bethel, but he doesn't. He gets detoured along the way. He winds up in a place called Shechem. He buys some property there and now makes his home there and that's when all hell breaks loose. In other words, he doesn't do what he said he was gonna do. He detours from what God's plan was and what God's direction was. Chaos breaks out in his life until he faces a crisis again like he did earlier with his brother, only this time is with his children. And now the chaos in his own home, which was like the chaos in his father's home, produces God coming to him a second time, telling him, aren't you supposed to be back in Bethel? God says, look, now that things are bad enough and you can't straighten it out, maybe I can get your undivided attention. You have detoured from my plan and my will. There's chaos in your house. Go and live in Bethel. That's your home. Because that's my home, the house of God. Make an altar there to God. Worship. Making an altar had to do with sacrifice, substitute for sin, get this spiritual stuff right in your life. Make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau over 20 years ago. Now what does this say? This, this says you can have a jacked up family for over 20 years. You can have chaos in your home for year after year after year after year when you have detoured from God. So there was a spiritual detour, but there's good news here. The good news here is that God spoke to Jacob. God was still talking to Jacob, even after 20 years. Parents, if you want to save your children, you better go to Bethel. If you want to save your family, you better go to Bethel. It is the place where you meet God. He says that's where God spoke to you was at Bethel. Verse 2. Uh, how do you know when God is trying to get you somewhere else? Because he allows too much chaos where you are. He allows where you are not to work. How you're situated right now, this is not working. And the more I try to make it work, the messier it gets. Verse 2, so Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods which are among you, purify yourselves, change your garments because we going to Bethel. He ready to go now. It's called relocate, relocate, relocate. We in the wrong spot here. Now notice what he says. He says you got to do three things. One, put away foreign gods. Now watch this. He's the father. He's the husband. He says, Put away foreign gods. So there are idols in his house. He's the head of the house. There are idols in the house. He knows there are idols in the house. He's been hanging out with idols in the home for over 20 years. An idol is anything you look to and treat it like it is God in your life. That means you've got two gods. And whenever you invite an idol, you invite a demon because idols are demonized elements. So anything can become an idol. Your television can become an idol if it causes you to replace God in your life. In other words, if you can always watch your TV show but not get around to spending time with God, television became an idol. Rachel had brought the idols with her in chapter 31. It talks about Rachel bringing the idols of her father with her. 
And that means that contamination entered the home. Verse 34 says, now Rachel had taken the household idols and put them in the camel saddle and she sat on them. And so she brought the idols with her. The thing about it is, at some point, Jacob discovered it and didn't do anything about it. We know he knows they're there because he goes and tells them, we got to get rid of these idols. Because if we didn't have these idols, we wouldn't have this mess. We've got this mess because we've strayed from God and then brought foreign gods with us. We've got to get rid of the idols. He says the second thing is purify yourselves. Remove the sin out of your midst. Thirdly, change your clothes. Change your garments. To change the garment was symbolism of uh, reorienting the life. When a policeman puts on his blue uniform, the change of the clothes represents something. When you see that blue, you know that the change of the clothes means that he is more than just an ordinary man. He is a, uh, or she is a police officer with authority when they change the clothes. When the judge puts his robe on, you know he's not just an ordinary man, he's a person with authority. In other words, the change of clothes represents a another position. So to change your clothes meant to put on a new way of life, a new way of, of orientation. To change your clothes means we're going to do things differently now. We're not going to keep doing the way we're doing. We're not going to keep wearing the same old clothes over and over and over and over again. You have said to people in your family, to your children, why don't you change your clothes? You're wearing the same stuff. You're functioning the same way. We'll hear about the wardrobe change that took place in Jacob's life and what it'll take for us to do the same when Dr. Evans continues our message after this. Turning on the news or reading the headlines can leave us with a lot of questions. Why? What do I do? Where is God in all of this? It's these hard questions that bring us to our knees. Prayer is the God-given communication link between heaven and earth if we know how to pray. In Tony's upcoming book, Kingdom Prayer, he'll challenge you to tap into the power and authority you have in prayer and motivate you to utilize your access to our Heavenly Father. Pre-order your copy of Kingdom Prayer by October 3rd and it'll come to you with some incredible free extras for you, your small group, or church, like free downloads of Tony's book, America, Turning a Nation to God, the classic Answers to Prayer by Andrew Murray, and more. Get details now at TonyEvans.org. If you believe in the power of prayer, don't make it an afterthought. Pre-order Kingdom Prayer today at TonyEvans.org. Jacob finally mans up. He was the head of the family, but he was a bad leader. He was a bad leader because he did not control the spiritual level in the home. He didn't lead his family in God's way. He didn't make sure that there were no idols. And so the kids ran amok. Everything ran amok because he was no longer in control. Listen, men, if you are going to be the man God has called you to be, if we are going to be the men God has called us to be, if we're going to man up to our responsibility, that means we're looking out for idols that try to sneak in the home, even if your pretty wife brought it there. Leadership is not just a title. Leadership means overseeing the atmosphere where I live. Overseeing the atmosphere where I live. He says, you kids have damaged the household. God says, you need to go to Bethel. It is your spiritual departure, mister, that has put the family in this situation. And yet, it was contributed to by his wife by Rachel, who was so in love with her idols that instead of being a helpmate, she became a hurtmate. And so he says, I will arise, let us arise. And I love this, Jacob says, okay, I led you wrong, now I'm gonna lead you right. As for me and my house, Joshua put it. 
He says, you can serve the other gods of all these other nations, but in Joshua 24, 15, as for me in my house, I'm setting a spiritual agenda. So what the question is, particularly for the men, is are you setting the spiritual agenda for your home or are you just talking about I'm the leader? If you're not setting the spiritual agenda, you may be a good provider and that's great, we need more of those, but you should be setting the spiritual atmosphere for the household. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. He arises and goes to Bethel. I'm going to make an altar there because that's what God told me to do in verse 1. We're going to have a family worship. Family worship. By the way, men, are you leading your family in family worship? You're supposed to be doing that. I'm supposed to be the pastor here. You're supposed to be the pastor there. And you do it around the dinner table. You don't have to find a special time. You don't have to create a special time. You just use the dinner table. And you use it for more than eating. And you turn the television off, you turn the radio off, and you say, okay, we're going to talk, we're going to make sure the family's going well, we're going to make sure you're obeying your mother, we're going to make sure your, your, your work is being done, and now we're going to spend some time with the Lord. You say, well, I don't know what to go over. Yes, you do if you were in church on Sunday. <laughs> he arises and he goes there. He says, the reason I'm going back to God, the house of God, Bethel, is he answered me in the day of my distress. I remember I was in a mess 20 years ago and he came through. I'm in a mess now. I need to go back home to Bethel. As they journeyed, verse 5, there was a great terror upon the cities which were around them and they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. Wait a minute. Remember in chapter 34, verse 30, he's terrified that these folks are going to jack him up because of what his sons had done to all the men of the city. But because he manned up, rose up, and went home, it says the terror of the Lord, verse 5, came upon the city and they did not bother him. Because he was now going right, God entered in and protected him in a bad situation. It says he got up and started back home spiritually to Bethel. When he was on the way, he hadn't arrived yet, he was just pointed right. When he started moving right, and the family started moving right with him, it says the Lord intervened into his crisis situation and didn't let the circumstance he was in mess him up. Because they were out to kill him. But the terror of the Lord, it said, entered in. It could be for you financial terror or job terror, or career terror. It could be whatever it is that's making you afraid right now. But God is so great and so powerful, if you will move you and your family back to Bethel, God says that the crisis doesn't have to control you. So Jacob comes back to Bethel. He arrives at Bethel, verse 7. He built an altar there, a place of worship, sacrifice, and called the place, watch this now, little Hebrew, El Bethel, verse 7. Then God, verse 9, appeared to Jacob again when he came to Paddan Aram and he blessed him. You're looking for a blessing. You can't find it. Maybe it's because you're not back at Bethel. Where did he bless him? He blessed him at Bethel. He didn't bless him at Shechem. He blessed him at Bethel. He blessed him when he got relocated back to where he was supposed to have been all the time. He blessed him. How did he bless him? Watch this. God said to him, your name is Jacob. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. He called him Israel. God said to him, I am God Almighty, uh, El Shaddai. Let me say a word about El Shaddai, a little bit more Hebrew. 
El Shaddai means God Almighty. Why didn't he just say, I'm God? Why did he tell him my name is El Shaddai? Because when the Bible refers to El Shaddai, God Almighty, it's not merely talking about how powerful God is, because God is powerful just with the name God, all right? When he says God Almighty, it's referring to, here it is, here it is, here it is, the power of God to pull off his promises. El Shaddai doesn't just mean God is powerful. God means God is so powerful, he can pull off what he says he's going to do. Let me tell you another place where it's El Shaddai. El Shaddai is shown up in chapter 17 of Genesis when God has told Abraham he's going to have a baby at 100 and Sarah's going to get pregnant at 90 and they both laugh. They say, this is a joke. This has got to be funny. God said, why are you laughing? I'm El Shaddai. I am not only powerful, but I made a promise. So I'm so powerful, I can pull off my promise. You want to know, well, why am I not getting God's promise fulfilled for me? Why is it taking so long? Perhaps you're not located in the right place. He does not tell him I'm El Shaddai till he goes back to Bethel. When he gets back to Bethel, I am the God who can pull off the promise. The promise in chapter 35 is the very same promise that's in chapter 28. God didn't change is that the promise lay dormant until he returned to the location where God could pull it off. It was the location where he could hear God's voice. It was the location of God's house where God's presence was felt. He was back in fellowship with God, revival. And because he was back in fellowship with God, he says, I'm going to change your name. Now watch this. When God changes your name, it's because he's fixing your character. When God changes your name, doesn't mean he's just calling you something different. To change your name means something's messed up in your nature. All right? Your character, you're a trickster, you're a conniver, you're evil, you're mean, you're disgraceful. So you just don't need religion, you need a character change. But the only place I can change your character is at my location. It's not enough to believe in God. Believing in God is nice, but he says, if you believe in me, If you follow me, you're going to see heaven touch earth. And I believe there's somebody in here today that needs to see heaven touch earth. I believe there's somebody here today that needs to see heaven do something in history. I believe there's somebody here today who needs eternity to touch time. Somebody here to fix your personality, to fix your rebellion. You didn't brought into your marriage the misery of your mother. You brought into your marriage the failure of your father. You're seeing worked out in your children the rebellion you showed to your parents. You're seeing this transfer and you need God to turn this thing or you better go back to Bethel. And according to the scripture, Bethel is when you take Jesus Christ seriously and follow him by faith. That is your new Bethel. And at Bethel is where God speaks brand new. He speaks afresh. Dr. Tony Evans talking about how revival can spread from you to your entire family. Now, if you'd like to get the complete full-length version of today's lesson, it comes as a part of Tony's brand new 14-part compilation, Marriage Matters. Remember, if you contact us right away and help us out with a contribution of any size to help us keep Tony's teaching on this station, we'd like to send you all seven messages in Volume 2 of this set as our thank you gift. At the same time, don't miss your chance to pre-order Kingdom Prayer and get all those free bonuses you heard about earlier. All the details are waiting for you at TonyEvans.org. You can also call our 24-hour resource request line at 1-800-800-3222. That's 1-800-800-3222. Does your home feel like a little slice of heaven? Tony says it literally can be and should be. Join us Monday as he talks about how that transformation can take place. The Alternative with Dr. Tony Evans is brought to you by The Urban Alternative and is made possible by the generous contributions of listeners like you.